2 Timothy 3.16. God's word says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and with careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. So Paul told the young Timothy. So just to, to nail our colours to the mast, all scripture is God-breathed. And that was certainly the conviction John Calvin, who will be considering this morning, he was under that. It's our custom here at Woodlands Church, awkward to preach systematically through the scriptures, but every now and again, we're just going to take a little bit of a break to consider some of the heroes of the faith. In the book of Hebrews in the Bible, chapter 11, it, it has a whole list of people who were heroes of the faith, and the, the writer to the Hebrews encourages us, us to consider their lives and imitate them. Well, it's talking about Abraham and David and Isaiah and so on. And yes, we want to do that. But I don't think it excludes people who were born and lived after the canon of Scripture were closed. I think it's our encouragement to study Christian biography for our encouragement. Okay? Study Christian biography for your encouragement. In... 1989, in 1989, Europe stood with their jaws dropped open because of the massive things that were happening in Central Europe. The mighty Soviet Union granted freedom and independence to Latvia, to Lithuania, Estonia, Georgia, and a whole load of other Eastern Bloc countries without bloodshed. That was amazing. The Cold War between Russia and America was beginning to melt. And we saw, amazingly, we saw the fall of the Berlin Wall. All these things happened within a couple of months of each other. The map of Europe was, with, was redrawn. And us over here in, in Britain and many parts of the world, we just stood amazed at what was happening. The world was never the same again. And so it was in the 1500s. Europe saw a, a massive seismic change when the church went through the Reformation. The mighty Catholic Church had lost the fact that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking. They'd lost that and so they started to drift away from the Bible. They considered that the Pope had the ultimate authority over the Bible. Massive mistake. And they allowed money to supposedly buy you favour with God, which is absolute heresy. So people like Martin Luther, from a reading of the Bible, rediscovered the beautiful theology of justification by faith alone. And so the, the, the power and the authority of the Roman Catholic Church was shaken. And the world was never the same again. Because of the Reformation 500 years ago, the world was never the same again. The two towering le leaders of the Re Reformation were Martin Luther, who we considered about two months ago, and John Calvin. Luther in Germany and John Calvin, though he was French, his influence came from when he lived in Switzerland for many years. So, 
John Calvin. John Calvin. Martin Luther was 25 years old when he went to the church in Wittenberg and started to teach there and at the university in Wittenberg. That was the year, 1509, when John Calvin was born. Okay, so they were more or less contemporaries of each other. It's thought that they never met, but it's thought that they probably had some correspondence between each other. When John Calvin was 14 years old, his father sent him to university. That was the age back in those days. Off he went to Paris to study theology. His father wanted him to enter the Roman Catholic Church. Paris at this time was untouched by the Reformation. And so Calvin was born up here in 1509 in Nuon. Then he went to Paris. Later he went to Orléans and then to Bourges. After five years in Paris studying theology, his dad had a change of mind and decided that actually a degree in law would be better for his son, so that's when Calvin was moved to Orléans and Bourges. And it was while at university, in one of those two cities, that a um, dramatic change came over Calvin. He was converted. He was converted. We don't know exactly how it happened, but he wrote, God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame. Having thus received some taste of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with an intense desire to make progress. In other words, his heart was on fire and he had a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. I hope you have that too. A burning desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in 15, 1533, when Calvin was 24, a friend of his called Nicholas Kopp preached at the, uh, the opening of the new term at university. But when he preached, there was just too much influence of Martin Luther in his sermon so the authorities chased after him and he had to flee to Switzerland okay Martin Nicholas Kopp too much Lutheran influence he had to flee for his life to Switzerland he went from Orléans and Bourges over to Geneva Calvin was a close friend of Nicholas Kopp, so the authorities came looking for him too because it's thought that Calvin actually wrote the sermon for Nicholas Kopp. So they came looking for, for, for Calvin and he had to escape from his bedroom on a rope made of bed sheets. I mean, cartoon type of thing. He had to escape from his bedroom by climbing down a rope of bed sheets. And so he, he followed Kopp. First of all, to, to Basel in Switzerland. And what else should young Calvin do but learn, how, learn the Hebrew language? He'd already studied Greek in his free time at university, so why not learn Hebrew as well? If you're going to study the Bible, best study in the original languages. Isn't that right? I commend it to you, young men. Go for it. So he studied the, the biblical languages. He then moved on from Basel to Geneva and he hoped to have a quiet life just uh, studying and writing. But then he bumped into a gentleman called Guilhem Farrell. Farrell came knocking on his door asking for help in getting the Reformation started in, in, in Geneva. Calvin politely refused, saying that he wanted the quiet life of an, an academic. But Farrell had other ideas. Calvin wrote, Farrell burned with an extraordinary zeal to advance the gospel, and he proceeded to, to utter an imprecation that God would curse the, the tranquility of my studies if I should refuse to give him assistance. I was so stricken with terror that I desisted from the journey that I had undertaken. In other words, Farrell put, 
prayed a curse over him if he wouldn't get involved in the Reformation. And Calvin was so terrified that he agreed. And so when he was 27 years old, Cal Calvin settled in Geneva and became the pastor of St. Peter's Church. He was bullied into becoming pastor of St. Peter's Church by Farrell. Now Calvin started preaching systematically verse by verse by verse through the scriptures. He upset the, 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 the city council because these civic leaders were ungodly people. And Calvin refused to let them share the Lord's Supper. Unless your life is consistent with the Bible, you cannot share the Lord's Supper in our church. Well, they issued a law that no one could refuse them to share communion. Well, Calvin protested again. Calvin and Farrell were banned from preaching in their own church. Of course, they carried on, and so they were very un unceremoniously expelled from the city of Geneva. Calvin was heartbroken. The Reformation was just getting underway in Geneva, and now he was afraid that his radical preaching, because he'd been pushed out and because he'd upset the, the civic authorities, he was afraid that this, the city would turn back to the unbiblical Roman Catholicism of the day. He was heartbroken. But at the same time, he was relieved. He was relieved because now he thought, I'll go to Strasbourg and I can settle down to write and to study. And life will be wonderfully quiet again. And so he moved on to, from Geneva to Strasbourg. When he was at Strasbourg, he walked straight into the arms of a gentleman called Martin Brusser. What did Brusser do? He bullied Calvin into becoming the pastor of a church for French refugees after calling him, you're nothing but a Jonah, deserting God's calling on your life. And so Calvin was bullied again into becoming a church pastor. Poor guy, all he wants to have, do is to have a quiet life and settle down as an academic. But these are, these are heady days that he lived in. So Calvin spent the next three years being pastor to 500 French refugees in Switzerland, in Strasbourg. And he was very happy amongst his own countrymen again. Calvin was French, he was very happy to be amongst the French people again. The most significant thing that happened in his three years at Strasbourg was that he found a wife. Now he had previously written Get this, ladies. This is his description of what kind of wife he was looking for. He said, as for marriage, I am not one of those uh, infatuated lovers who are captivated by a pretty face. The only beauty that interests me is that she should be modest, obliging, humble, not extravagant, but patient and concerned for my health. Pretty romantic, eh? <laughs> But he did find somebody like that amongst his own congregation. There was a couple there called John and Idlet Strouder. John died in 1540. What would Calvin be then, 31? John Strouder died, and so Calvin married his widow later that same year and took into his house her two children. The marriage was not intended for bliss. Idolette became pregnant, the baby was born and died within two weeks. Cal as a demonstration of his trust in the sovereignty of God, Calvin wrote, the Lord has certainly inflicted a bitter and severe wound in the death of our baby son, but he is a father and he knows what is best for his children brave man that can say that. Two further children died. And then Idolette herself died from tuberculosis. The one married, they only married eight or nine years before she died. And Calvin, Calvin never remarried, but did bring up Idolette's two children from her previous marriage as his own. 
So after three years in Strasbourg, Calvin received an unexpected letter. The council leaders from Geneva, you know where he'd been expelled from? The council leaders invited him to come back and be pastor again at his old church, which is still there by the way, St. Peter's Church in Geneva. They asked him if he would come back to be pastor. He told Farrell, I'm not going back to Geneva, that's a dreadful city. I would rather die a hundred deaths on the cross than go back to Geneva. But guess what? Farrell and Bruce bullied him into going back to Geneva and he became pastor of St. Peter's Church again. And so in September 1541, he entered Geneva for the second time. The air was thick with expectation when Calvin climbed the, the steps to the pulpit for the very first time. The congregation braced themselves surely for a torrent of bitterness that should come from this man who'd been so rudely expelled from the city three years later. But what did Calvin do? He simply turned to the very next verse from where he had left off three years earlier and continued preaching systematically through the Bible. And the people flocked to hear him. The people flocked to hear him when he arrived in Geneva. The population of Geneva was 100,000. Within, within a number of years, the, si the city doubled in size. The city doubled in size because people flocked in to hear the glorious news of Jesus Christ. They wanted to uproot and move house so that they could grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Imagine a hundred thousand people choosing to move to a new city so that they hear about Christ. The, the newcomers mainly came from, from France, which was still very heavily uh, Catholic dominated. Um, and so the, the city was transformed over the years as industries like Switzerland, what do you think of chocolate and clock making? Clock making was established in the time of John Calvin as these new workers, new people came in looking for work. Even the language on the street was changed from the German dialect to French because there were so many French moving in there. But lest we think that revival had broken out in Geneva, it's fair to say that not everybody was pleased with the changes going on there. It's fair to say that racism reared its ugly head, the, 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 the Swiss were not happy to have all these French coming in, and so there was a level of racism there. There were riots on the street and people deliberately went into St. Peter's Church to disrupt the service and made an almighty noise of shuffling, shuffling the bottoms on the seat, shuffling their feet and coughing and coughing and coughing when Calvin got up to preach. Calvin got used to going to bed at night time with a mob outside his own house threatening to throw him in the river and shooting their, their muskets saying that they were, they were going to kill him. One of the thorns in Calvin's side was a group of people called the Libertines in Geneva. They were professing Christians who believed that the more you sin, the more God's grace will pour out. That sounds good, doesn't it? The more you sin, the more God forgives you, the more God's grace is poured out. So everybody is a winner. You get the fun, God gets the glory. Immorality, and particularly adultery, was rife across the city and rife within the church. The Libertines believed that, believed that their freedom in Christ allowed them to be sexually promiscuous. And so in 1533, when one of the leading Libertines approached the Lord's table to take the bread and the wine, Calvin prayed with a lump in his throat because he expected that day to be expelled from the city again. As the Libertine walked down the central aisle in the church, Calvin threw his arms around 
the bread and the wine as if to protect them from sacrilege. And his voice rang out through the church, these hands you may crush, these arms you may chop off, my life you may take, my blood is yours, you may shed it, but you will never force me to give holy things to the profane and dishonour the table of my Lord. Calvin's life hung by a thread. He would not shift. His only concern was for the glory of the Lord Jesus who loved him so much. In 1555, when Calvin was 46, the tide turned in Geneva. The elections were, were won by reformed Christians and they approved, of course, of, of Calvin's work, of, of, approved of his teaching. This sparked a riot in the, in the town, but then they remembered respectable Swiss people don't riot. And so they merely rounded up the ringleaders and threatened to, uh, to behead them, but most of them escaped before that actually happened. So Calvin grasped this wonderful God-given opportunity the first thing he did, and perhaps one of the main things that he did, was to open a Bible college. He opened a Bible college that provided a general education, but also a taught good, solid, biblical theology. And the ripple effect was that church pastors and missionaries were trained in his college and sent out across the whole world. John Knox went to Calvin's Bible College and he went back to Scotland and made massive progress for the gospel lay under Calvin's influence. Missionaries were sent from the Bible College in Geneva to Poland, to, to Hungary, to the Netherlands, to Italy and even across to South America. The world was changing as pastors and missionaries were sent out from this excellent Bible school. Geneva became a nerve centre for world evangelism because one man was gripped with the scriptures and with a love for the Lord Jesus the world was never the same again Calvin worked tirelessly teaching in the college day after day and preaching twice most Sundays he wrote commentary after commentary on the books of the Bible it's thought that he never took a day off and as a result, his health suffered. His health suffered. For the last 10 years, he was often, often in, the last 10 years of his life, he was often in excruciating pain. He suffered terribly from arthritis, from colic, from hemorrhoids. He had acute pain in his legs, from ulcers, and he had kidney stones. In early uh, 1564, he sensed that his time was drawing near. He wrote, I have no other defence of refuge for salvation other than God's gratuitous adoption on which alone my salvation stands. In other words, I trust in Christ only, and that is enough. He called some of the local pastors to his bedside and says and said, Brothers, I after I am dead Persist in this work and be not dispirited. And on the 27th of May, 1564, Calvin died. He was just 54 years old. At his request, he was buried in an unmarked grave because he was afraid that some, some people may come and make his, take his bones to be a, a relic such as what happened in the Catholic Church. And that would deny the Reformation that he lived for. So, no glamour, no gravestone, typical Calvin. So what's been the legacy of John Calvin through these 500 years as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation this year? What's been his legacy? I think there are three main ones. His first is the, his commitment to the Bible. The second is the book that he wrote, The Institutes of Christian Religion. And the third one is 
Calvinism. Let me explain. His commitment to the Bible. Calvin was absolutely convinced, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book had authority over Calvin's life. He loved this book because in this book he saw the life and death and resurrection of his saviour. Calvin changed the world through his passion for, for God and which was displayed in the glory. Calvin knew that God's glory is revealed in creation around us, absolutely. But Calvin believed that God's glory is most clearly revealed in the pages of the scriptures. And so he strongly encouraged the ordinary men and women to read the Bible for themselves. The Catholic Church never ever said that. Read the Bible for yourself back in those days. Calvin was a great believer in that. He was committed to systematic preaching of the Bible, verse by verse by verse. And he wrote many commentaries on the Bible. that are still in print now. This is his commentary on the book of Genesis. A dainty little read. But it's still in print because it's still helpful. It's still helpful to the church today. Many of his commentaries are still in printing by brand new copies because his work is still the positive influence on the church today. So his commitment to the scriptures. The second one is his book, The Institutes of Christian Religion. Calvin's greatest work that he wrote was probably this book, The Institutes of Christian Religion. It's a thorough systematic theology, teaching Christians what they, what they need to know about this is what all the Bible says about God. This is what the whole Bible says about Christ, about salvation, about baptism, about the Lord's Supper, etc. It went through a whole number of, of revisions during his life. The first one was very slim. But he, don't, he, he, he wrote it when he'd only been Christian for two or three years. It was slim enough to hide in your pocket. But it, it was dedicated to King Francis I, of France, his own king. Why? Because he knew that the king would be flattered if he saw that it was dedicated to him. So what would he do? He would read it and hopefully be converted and his, his influence could spread across the whole of France. Now we think it's a big deal to give out a, a Christian tract to somebody. Calvin went one much better than that. He wrote a book of theology and sent it to the king and hoped that the king, hoped and prayed that the king would be converted. Bold step. Great imagination. It's still in print. This was this is a revision from nine, from 2014. Okay, it's gone through yet another. Revision just in 2014. I was given this as a gift uh, when, when Lynn and I first came here by our son. Systematic theology of what we need to know about God. This kind of stuff warms your heart, folks. His legacy continues down the years. So the third point, of, oh, that's the front cover of the early edition of the Institute. And the third influence down the years is Calvinism. Now Calvinism gets a bad press. But Calvinism was something that John Calvin had nothing to do with. It came about 50 years after he died. So he can hardly be blamed for it. Calvin, Calvinism was introduced when some liberal teaching came from uh, from the Netherlands called Armenianism. It was introduced to the church and so a council met in Dortrecht in the Netherlands in 1619 to counteract the spread of Armenianism. And so Calvin was born. And so these, these good Dutchmen 
gave it the acronym of TULIP. Well, being Dutch, they would. They, <laughs> they gave it the acronym, the, the Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism, the, the acronym of TULIP. Let me explain what they are very briefly. T stands for total depravity. Now that does not mean that we are as bad as we could possibly be. I don't suppose in this hall this morning there are many of us who've been mass murderers, child abusers or drug pushers, right? That, that would be wickedness in the extreme. Not many of us have gone to those extremes. But all of us, we know, have a sinful heart, don't we? So when it says total, it means all mankind. All mankind is by nature sinful. U stands for unconditional election. That means God chooses some people for salvation, but not everybody. Now if you think of the Old Testament, who were the people that he chose for salvation? Israel. Who did God not choose for salvation? The rest of the world. God has that right. He is God. So, all unconditional election means that God chooses some people for salvation, but not everybody. And it has nothing to do with a person's worth or merit. It's all of his grace alone. L stands for limited atonement. That means that on the cross, the blood of Jesus paid the price for the sins of those who would trust Christ, for Christians, but it, did not, it does not pay for the sins of everybody who rejects Christ. That sounds sensible, doesn't it? His atonement is limited to Christians only, not to the whole world. I stands for irresistible grace. When God intends to call somebody to faith, there's nothing we can do to reject it. Because God is sovereign and his spirit will work through your, uh, through your, your rejection. When God intends to save somebody, they will not be able to resist the call of the Holy Spirit. And P stands for perseverance of the saints. By his grace, God keeps true Christians in the faith right to the very end of their lives without letting them fall away for, for salvation. Now, people may backslide for a short time, but the true Christian will always come back to faith before they die. Now, I don't have any problem with any of those five points. To me, they seem entirely biblical. So I, I'm, I'm personally happy to sign up to them. Um, so as we come to a close, we are, I, we are grateful that God always raises up men to teach the scriptures so that God will be glorified and man will be most satisfied in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that that would happen in this generation. We pray that God would raise up people in this city. We pray that God would raise up these people in this church to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ as found in the scriptures so that all the glory goes to Almighty God.